Okay, our next speaker is Chris Bretherton from University of Washington. Chris. Well, another person who was uh, invited to this meeting and uh, couldn't come was Bjorn Stevens. And since uh, I was originally assigned a topic about which I uh, feel like I know nothing in confidence, namely how to model clouds and GCMs, um, uh, I decided instead I would uh, sort of um, take up some of the topics that Bjorn would have ta uh, taken up here and, uh, and talk about those uh, instead. So the title in uh, honor of Bjorn is, Are GCM Simulations of the Second Indirect Worth Anything? Okay, so as we all know, and as uh, Ken and and uh, Steve Robb pointed out, and so on. Um, there are lo lots of reasons why we have uncertainties in uh, simulations of uh, aerosol, anthropogenic aerosol effects, the uh, effective radiative forcing due to aerosol cloud interaction in particular, one of those great terms that we invented during the IPCC um, chapter seven deliberations. Um, and, uh, there are many, so there are many reasons for these uncertainties. Uh, clouds and cloud aerosol interactions are highly multi-scale, a lot of subgrid heterogeneity on the scale of a GCM grid cell. Uh, clouds are multi-phase, liquid, ice, mixed. Aerosols themselves have lots of issues with phase. Um, Ice nuclei, we don't understand that much about. We have uh, a lot of uncertainties in pre-industrial aerosol sources, life cycles, a ton of physical processes interacting in all models, but in particular GCMs, that uh, affect uh, aerosol cloud interactions on time scales of seconds to days. So it's not just the processes that are involved, but the discretization of those processes and time uh, as well as space, uh, which are uh, important. And uh, the result, of course, is that we have a range of uh, climate model um, aerosol indirect effects and, uh, and of aerosol effects in general. And uh, in general, also, those uh, tend to be, the ones from the CMIP 5 models tend to be stronger than some vaguely satellite-based um, estimates of, of what the effects should be. Uh, here I'm just going to take one small part of this problem, which is the part that uh, Bjorn was getting uh, most wor worked up about, which is uh, warm cloud uh, effects, in particular the, uh, the lifetime effect. So uh, thanks to uh, Toomey, we have uh, a partitioning of a stratiform warm cloud uh, albedo into uh, change in albedo due to droplet concentration, the Toomey effect, and change due to liquid water path or more gen generally cloud fraction, anything that changes the cloud macrophysics, that's the lifetime effect. And so the uh, lifetime effect already presupposes a bias about what this is going to be, the bias being that uh, Clouds with more droplets will last longer, and therefore this should be positive, and that is exactly uh, perhaps the issue that Bjorn wanted to harp on. Uh, and in particular, the lifetime effect depends not so much on aerosol parameterizations, but on cloud convection parameterizations. In other words, how do clouds respond to a change in droplet concentration? And it's one of the main, it's one of the sources of uncertainty in aerosol indirect effects. Okay, well, this changed uh, since my, uh, from the Mac to the PC, but uh, in any case, this was meant to be a comparison of two models, uh, one of which is uh, CAM5 and one of which is MACM, which is a super parameterized version of CAM5 with a sort of a, an aerosol module attached to it uh, generated by PNNL. Um, both of these models agree acceptably uh, with uh, current climatologies of cloud radiative forcing. So this is the um, uh, okay. So this is the uh, MMF, which is the, uh, the super parameterized um, models, uh, shortwave cloud forcing versus series, 
and long wave cloud forcing versus satellite series. And you can see these agree with each other, similarly for CAM5. Uh, they both actually also produce relatively similar climatologies of uh, pre industrial droplet concentration that are not in ridiculous disagreement with MODIS. Uh, but uh, they produce quite different uh, shortwave um, aerosol effects. Um, present day minus pre industrial changes of minus 0.8 watts per meter squared for the MMF and minus 1.8 watts per meter squared from CAM5. And I think most of you know the reason for this kind of effect uh, has to do with uh, the cloud lifetime effect, changes in, in liquid water path and cloud fraction. And in particular, just looking at liquid water path, uh, the present day liquid water path uh, is in many places um, something as much as 50 or 60% larger than the pre-industrial liquid water path in CAM5. And in the MMF, you see some of the same trends, but the effects are much weaker. The overall increase in liquid water path is about a third as large. And you know, I chose these models. They're just uh, examples. But uh, you can compare different, even different conventional climate models like CAM5 and see a range of strengths of this uh, lifetime effect. And uh, those lifetime effect uh, differences project onto the aerosol and direct effect quite strongly. So the real question then is, uh, do we believe this? And should we believe this or this or neither? And uh, this is where um, we obviously need some more constraints. And uh, so Bjorn came up with uh, an email that some of you got. I don't know how many people in this room got this, but uh, I certainly did, and several of us. Uh, so he was advertising a new paper that uh, he had submitted that was looking at um, large domain simulations of trade cumulus convection on a 50 by 50 kilometer domain. And in particular, these simulations were done with um, specified droplet concentrations ranging from 35 to 105 per cc, and he was interested in looking at um, aerosol indirect effects, in particular lifetime effect in simulations of trade cumulus clouds, and these were based on something called the RICO experiment. So uh, basically, just to discuss what Bjorn said, he said, we recently submitted a paper which shows, using very high resolution simulations of trade cumulus clouds, that lifetime effects most likely act to diminish rather than enhance the potency of the Tumi effect and act in direct opposition to what is usually parameterized in large scale clouds. So in other words, neither of those models is reasonable that I showed you. This work provides yet further evidence that the inclusion of lifetime effects in a fashion that's become customary for many modeling centers distorts the model climate response to forcing. Here's where I think he was treading on a little bit uh, less safe ground, because he's almost saying it's deliberate. Um, I don't doubt that there are specific effect instances where a lifetime effect might behave as parameterized in many models, such as pockets of open cells, or in some transient uh, situations. So perhaps in balance, the lifetime effect is on average close to zero rather than markedly negative. But the case for strong positive lifetime effects as have come to be incorporated in many models is, I think, untenable. By throwing out models that continue to incorporate demonstrably artificial representations of lifetime effects, I see new opportunities to narrow aerosol forcing uncertainty in large scale models. So, um, so that then uh, provoked some responses, as you might expect. Um, but before uh, looking at them, let's just uh, look at the paper so that you can see uh, exactly what he was saying. So he had these large domain simulations. And these are cloud fields after 60 hours of simulation. So after the, each of the simulations had a, had a chance to evolve to a point where the trade cumulus clouds were in some kind of quasi-equilibrium and where actually they were uh, all precipitating at about one millimeter per day. So this is um, 35 droplets, 70 droplets, and 105 drops per cc. And the basic point is you can look at these three cloud fields and I'm not sure I could tell which one had larger cloud fraction or was sort of brighter than the other ones. 
And in particular, if he compared the actual uh, change in albedo from different parts of this uh, simulation, they, they started out all shallow and non-precipitating. And in that point, basically, there's very little liquid water path change between the simulations in response to uh, drop, doubling of droplet concentration. And uh, there is a Tumi effect, and that was the dominant effect. There's a transition region as they transition to precipitation. And then the near equilibrium regime in which this is in, you can see that you can't even necessarily tell what the change in albedo is. The Tumi effect is still positive, but the lifetime effects, the changes in liquid water path and cloud fraction, or who knows what they are, but they're certainly not definitively uh, positive. So basically, uh, what you can say for sure from this is the sensitivity of precipitating trade cumulus cloud cover and liquid water path in an LES, which has its own microphysical parameterizations, which are also uncertain, to ND doubling seem to be pretty weak. OK, so that was kind of what, where Bjorn is coming from. That's one reason that he's saying this. He's also saying this for other reasons. Um, but uh, we won't get into those. Well, OK, obviously, we, we heard some responses. And Steve, uh, who's not here, uh, also pointed out, well, OK, uh, that's not where we see um, lifetime effects uh, when we do simulations. We, we mainly see them. Uh, in mid-latitude clouds because those are being the ones that are actually being influenced by aerosol enhanced, anthropogenic aerosol enhancements. So you can't draw global conclusions from analysis of trade cumulus clouds. And Rob basically uh, also said, and I guess I want to harp on this point some more, uh, before throwing out GCMs entirely, it's important to notice that the effect in question, which actually had to do with mix, vertical mixing processes in trade cumulus clouds acting as a feedback here, um, which sort of removed the cloud lifetime effect, is also likely to be an effect that's critical for understanding and quantifying cloud feedbacks uh, to anthropogenic uh, greenhouse warming as well. And in fact, uh, some of the same mechanisms at work here to make small cloud lifetime effects are, in fact, similar to mechanisms which um, produce positive cloud feedbacks in the, subtropical, in the subtropics in climate models. So applying an even hand here would require either that we stop using GCMs to study any climate behavior that's mediated by turbulence cloud interactions, or that we seek model improvements um, that uh, represent these processes better. And Rob then made a case for looking at the second um, and actually a parameterization approach called CLUB, which perhaps might be a path forward for both of these problems. OK, fine. So uh, I guess now I just want to take a look at these arguments uh, from, since Bjorn isn't here, um, from someone else's point of view. And I guess I think Bjorn actually has a point. Um, we also see uh, positive lifetime effects, uh, well, we also see uh, negative lifetime effects in other situations, not only in LES of shallow cumulus clouds, but also weakly precipitating stratocumulus clouds, and I'll show some examples of that shortly. Uh, on the other hand, there are other cases, like LES of precipitating stratocumulus clouds, like pockets of open cells, these very definitely show positive lifetime effects. So if we call this buffering, this would be sort of anti-buffering. Uh, and uh, one cause for this, uh, again, we'll review this shortly, is uh, that there are feedbacks between uh, droplet size, entrainment, droplet sedimentation, and evaporation processes that are perhaps not well represented in GCMs. Uh, there are also other processes which might affect the um, lifetime effect. For instance, precipitation uh, processes, how precipitation, um, precipitation accretion, removal of droplets uh, that way uh, in both stratiform and cumulus clouds, and uh, in general, the issues of cumulus parameterization, since many cumulus parameterizations don't even have uh, a representation of uh, aerosol sensitivity. OK, well, just as an observational example of uh, a negative lifetime effect, um, 
Uh, I like this example of a volcano track. You can also see the same effect in ship tracks in polluted boundary layers too. Um, this is the South Sandwich Islands. This is a MODIS visible image. And you can see here's, here's a volcano here. You're about uh, 50 degrees south. This is about uh, 400 kilometers here. And you can actually see a brightening uh, of the clouds in the lee of the volcano. And if you take a look, you can actually decompose this into changes in effective radius. The effective radius is drastically reduced in the volcano tracks by basically by a factor of uh, almost two. And if you look at the liquid water path, well, here things are a little bit more difficult. I think this is a um, retrieve from the uh, optical depth and the effective radius. Uh, what you can see, though, is that here, for instance, you have red, so higher liquid water path. Here in the volcano track, you actually have a lower liquid water path. So if anything, there is uh, what appears to be a negative lifetime effect, a reduction of liquid water path in the stratiform cloud due to an addition of aerosol. So you can clearly get negative lifetime effects, uh, and we, so we do see those. And we can make them in process models quite easily. So this study by Andy Ackerman et al. Uh, in particular found that uh, if you take a look at the liquid water path in simulations of different boundary layer cloud regimes as a function of droplet concentration, there are two regimes. There's a regime where if you increase the droplet concentration, liquid water path goes up. That's this regime. And that tends to be the regime where the surface precipitation uh, exceeds about a tenth of a millimeter per day. And then there's another regime where as you increase the droplet concentration further, liquid water path goes down, and uh, that uh, is where the surface precipitation tends to be quite weak. And this second effect then, um, in Andy's paper and in another paper that I wrote, this was argued then to be an entrainment effect. So uh, clouds with more droplets entrain more efficiently. And the reason is that the, uh, that the droplets in the uh, entrainment zone are smaller. They don't fall out of the entrainment zone so easily. And so there's more water in the entrainment zone, um, more liquid water, to mix into the dry air that enhances evaporative cooling and produces more turbulence and more entrainment. Okay. So we have observational evidence. We have LES. We have a physical explanation of something. And in fact, this effect was, certainly at the time, we discovered it basically in no GCM at all. It's not just uh, stratus clouds, but also uh, um, even if you look at stratus to trade cumulus transition, you can see a similar uh, case. So in this case, these are simulations that we've done, not published, but um, where we uh, looked at a stratus to trade cumulus transition over a three-day period where basically the idea is you start with a boundary layer characteristic of um, sort of the middle of the stratus, subtropical stratus region, then you slowly warm up the sea surface temperature, the boundary layer deepens and ultimately might transition to cumulus clouds, uh, but during this period it doesn't, but it, uh, it decouples. And so what you're seeing here, height, time, is uh, the, a, the horizontal mean cloud fraction. So blue here indicates cumulus cloud regions, and red indicates regions of solid stratocumulus. And uh, so these are decoupled boundary layers. They're midway between well-mixed stratus and trade cumulus. And you can see for this case, if you look at the 25 per cc versus, say, the 400 per cc, the red region is notably thicker than the blue region. So the clouds are, are thicker for the lower droplet concentration. And in fact, if you uh, look at that more carefully, uh, here is the liquid water path for the three simulations. Here is 400 on the bottom, 25 on the top, and the LES is clearly indicating that there's more liquid water path throughout the entire simulation for the highest droplet concentration, uh, uh, excuse me, for the lowest droplet concentration compared to the highest. So this is a fairly robust effect, then. We can see it in a variety of boundary layer cloud regimes in the subtropics. Uh, we can see a negative lifetime effect. And um, it can have a fairly significant uh, uh, effect uh, on radiation. So for instance, if you compare the 
the blue to the green, so this is a factor of four droplet concentration here, and you actually take a look at what the change in the radiation is, there's a change due to the Tumi effect, but it's counteracted so much by the liquid water path increase that there's relatively little change in the shortwave cloud radiative forcing averaged over daily intervals here during these simulations. Well, on the other hand, if you, if you go to higher droplet concentrations, then basically what you mainly find is a Tumi effect. And so now the question is, well, okay, so do, you know, do the physics say in the CAM5 climate model reproduce this? So we've run this thing with a single column version of the CAM5, and uh, obviously the CAM5 doesn't produce such a pretty looking stratus to cumulus transition. There it is, trying to do the same thing, but it sort of does, maybe vaguely, something like this. Uh, and uh, now, can you guess what the sensitivity is here? <laughs> Not sure I could from this picture, but, um, but if we look, the sensitivity of the liquid water path to um, the change in droplet concentration is, in fact, exactly reversed from the LES. So the red line here is 400 per cc. The blue line is 25 per cc, and now you can see the blue line is nicely below the red line, so that, then you have a positive lifetime effect. So, so clearly there are some, then some discrepancies between what the climate model predicts and what the LES predicts, which may not be right, but is more likely to be right, probably, than, than not. So maybe adding a sedimentation feedback to CAM5 would help reverse this. Well, in fact, we tried to do this. We spent a lot of time trying to make the SCAM behave the same way as this. It actually proved to be remarkably hard. Um, and when we did, then we ran it globally, and we got this result. So uh, what this result shows you is um, Pre, uh, present day minus pre-industrial change in liquid water path with a sedimentation feedback added, so you might expect this to decrease the liquid water path, and without a, such a feedback. So that's the default version of the model, S and N. And uh, so, for instance, if you look at the N, the control model, you can see that there is a positive lifetime effect, an increase of liquid water path over large parts of the northern hemisphere oceans, for instance, as well as over China and so on. And there's really no evidence of anywhere where there's a significant decrease in liquid wood path and negative lifetime effect. Well, you add sedimentation and you look and I'll be darned if I could tell the difference between these two. It had absolutely zero effect. So, you know, this nice new piece of physics that we thought was going to help solve the problem didn't do squat. And I have to say, this is uh, unfortunately one of my experiences as a, both a process model and a GCM developer, is that often the things that you think are, are explaining the responses in a GCM are not necessarily the ones that are actually uh, the most important. So, uh, okay, there's some other examples of this, and I think Andrew might, who's here, might interpret this exactly the opposite way, but another thing that was done partly in response to thinking that aerosol indirect effects might be sensitive to it was putting prognostic precipitation into CAM. So the original version of CAM5 had diagnostic precipitation. Precipitation fell out in the same time step it was produced, and prognostic precipitation allows the precipitation to last, so precipitation from a previous time step can accrete and remove cloud droplets on the next time step. And the idea was perhaps that might affect the, the ratio of how liquid, um, cloud water was removed by uh, auto conversion, direct conversion to larger droplets by collisions versus accretion. And, uh, and perhaps make the model less sensitive to aerosol. Well, uh, you know, it sort of did. Um, if you but for instance, if you take a look at the, well, I can't get this thing to work. If you take a look at the change in liquid water path, for instance, um, between two simulations, a present day and a pre-industrial, there's an 8% increase in liquid water path in present day minus pre-industrial for the default CAM with the old microphysics or semi-old microphysics. And the new simulations, well, they do slightly remove the, uh, uh, reduce the lifetime effect 
but it's not exactly overwhelming. It's not like they've made it go away or anything. And similarly, if you look at the radiation changes, well, if you put in the prognostic precipitation, you do decrease the overall aerosol uh, effect from minus 1.2 watts in, in this one configuration all the way down to 0.8 watts. But then you put in the fancy new boundary layer scheme that can also represent the effects of aerosols on cumul shallow cumulus convection, and whoops, it's all back again. So um, again, you know, I think the processes we don't treat well in GCMs may cut both ways. They aren't necessarily all going to decrease um, aerosol effects. OK, so returning to Bjorn's position then, well, LES, you know, I think there are a few weaknesses with using process models here. Indeed, I think the issue with mid-latitude cloud regimes is a very uh, good one. I don't think that there's any reason to think that mid key mid-latitude cloud regimes respond to aerosols in the same way as, as subtropical clouds. Um, I guess I would also say that I don't think, based based on my experience uh, working with other GCM modelers, that GCMs are deliberately biased. Uh, I think we, um, in fact, the problem that we have is that it's hard to incorporate process knowledge into GCMs. That's a complicated process because there are a lot of things interacting, and the change you make doesn't necessarily have the effects that you want, and then you have to figure out why. Uh, and in particular, what this means also is that we, um, well, maybe not, not quite the same point, but I would also say that process models are also a limited view on aerosol cloud interaction, and we learn from representing aerosol in cloud interaction in a hierarchy of models that represent different scales because they can incorporate <laughs> different observational constraints on what's going on. So I guess I would say, you know, based on these perspectives, GCMs should strive to fully represent lifetime effects. I don't think process model understanding is not a substitute for GCMs. And this isn't a fool's errand, but I do think it has to be done mindfully. I mean, we have to be aware of, of the possibility of, of, of biases, and we have to be better at using the observations that we have. In particular, 1850 to present climate change, as everyone in this room recognizes, is an inadequate test of aerosol cloud interaction. And in particular, I think something that probably most of us could agree on, individual groups have developed many, many metrics uh, for looking at aerosol cloud interaction, but as a, it seems like as a community, the set of agreed on metrics for constraining a model is much weaker, and that's something that I think needs to be changed. Um, I think, not mentioned here, I'm also a member of the Cloud Feedbacks uh, community. I'm co-chair of the Cloud Feedbacks Model into Comparison Project. There is, as Rob points out, a huge analogy between cloud feedbacks and aerosol in terms of uh, the, the aerosol um, cloud interaction problem in terms of the kinds of processes that are involved. And in particular, the cloud feedbacks community has recognized the need to try and develop and use emergent constraints. So the idea that a constraint about present climate that's predictive of uh, future uh, cloud feedbacks. And I think some of the experience there is quite interesting. We went from a situation of having no emergent constraints to in the past five years having probably five or 10 of them now, uh, all of which are different and which focus on different parts of the climate system, ranging from subtropical clouds to deep convection. Um, and uh, now we kind of have more than we can deal with. And then the question is, how do you decide when is the right emer when is a c emergent constraint the right emergent constraint? And should you expect there to be one emergent constraint anyhow, one thing about the present climate which predicts future climate? Um, I think those are things that we should talk about at this meeting. I guess the last thing is that I think that, uh, you know, we know that aerosols and clouds both respond to meteorology, and that this is one of the... Um, complexifying factors in interpreting observations, and I think forecast and nudged mode climate model into comparison might be very helpful, and certainly at UW we led an into comparison called VOCA for the South Pacific, Southeast Pacific, that I think was quite illuminating in that regard, and I think there's room for a lot more of that. So thanks. <laughs>